Good afternoon and uh, welcome to our Gibbs Flash Forum to to my panelists and to our uh, and to our guests. Uh, I see that the number of participants entering the room is uh, on its way up, making a steady march, um, uh, which is a December joke. And um, uh, we'll just give uh, a minute for uh, people to join before we get into uh, the cut and thrust of, uh, of the conversation. Um, uh, by, way of, um, uh, by way of backdrop uh, and then to introductions, um, as we close out 2021, uh, we have an opportunity to reflect on the year and think about the, uh, the way forward. Uh, and that's the purpose of this afternoon's conversation with, uh, with our three panelists and with you, uh, to talk about um, uh, uh, the, the business, the industry, the political, uh, geographic, uh, and uh, dare I say, pandemic context. Uh, we have wrestled uh, over the course of the last two years now with various states of uh, lockdown and easing. Um, and indeed, when I wrote the blurb for, uh, for this uh, uh, flash forum uh, just a few weeks ago, my sense was that, you know, with 20 months of COVID uh, behind us, uh, there was a light at the end of the tunnel. And boy, has that light dimmed or feels to have dimmed uh, in the last couple of days. We are, uh, in addition to uh, those COVID circumstances or Omicron circumstances, stressed by an ongoing energy deficit, uh, a fiscal deficit that has taken uh, different shapes uh, uh, and increasingly stressed over the last uh, year, year and a half. Um, uh, new political arrangements that have been ushered in by the municipal elections. Uh, and against that backdrop of the changing economic, political, uh, and infrastructural uh, and institutional context. You know, what sense do we make uh, of this environment? And that's the conversation uh, that I invite you to join uh, this afternoon to talk with our, with our expert panel about the drivers uh, and the derailers from a, a stressed and at points tumultuous 2021. You know, are we on the road to economic recovery? Uh, what sense do we make of uh, the social uh, context? And how strong are those drivers? Uh, what is the uh, potential to derail them? What are the risks uh, that are lying uh, in wait for us? And will 2022 bring a better year after the hard times of the two COVID years that we have done? Uh, on the panel this afternoon, uh, Dr. The, my panelists uh, uh, need no introduction. My guests need absolutely no introduction. Uh, Dr. Dr. Tabi Leoka, an economic strategist um, uh, who works in public and private uh, sector consultancies. Uh, Asayan Klanga, uh, chief economist uh, from Alexander Forbes and Professor Nick Benadel, uh, the founding dean uh, of Gibbs uh, and um, working in uh, a number of important uh, domestic projects. And he finds his, himself uh, this afternoon on the road uh, uh, as he uh, is in the process of delivering on that social initiative. So from the different parts of the world that uh, each of the three of you are in, welcome and thank you for, for joining me. Um, uh, the running order that we have this afternoon uh, five minutes uh, for each of you to give your sense of where we find ourselves uh, and then uh, an opportunity to reflect, challenge, digest, and uh, then open the room to uh, questions and conversations. I would encourage, in fact, urge people uh, who have joined us this afternoon to put uh, questions, comments, thoughts, challenges into the chat uh, so that we can uh, discuss and engage. To, uh, to officially close the welcome, uh, I'm Professor Adrian Saville, uh, uh, Professor in Economics and Strategy at Gibbs, and it's my great pleasure to, to host the, the panel, which is one of the last uh, for, 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 for the business school uh, of the year. Before we get into our uh, official um, uh, five minute intros, I'm going to start with an opening observation to try and capture the year 2021 in three words. And if you go to 
uh, Greta Thunberg, her three words are blah, blah, blah. If uh, you ask me to capture domestic policy and domestic policy delivery uh, in three words, my three words are over promise and under deliver. Um, and if we go to uh, the global environment for three words, perhaps the three words that I can lean on come from George H. W. Bush, who said, read my lips. Uh, and he followed that with another three words, no more taxes. Uh, and uh, that's my sort of uh, uh, my segue into this afternoon's conversation to try and capture uh, some punchy uh, reference to what's going on in the, uh, the environment and uh, the confusion and the noise that is caused by uh, policy direction uh, that has switched very quickly uh, and that policy that can often be helicoptered in uh, at a moment's notice. Uh, case in point, the travel restrictions imposed uh, all of Friday of last week. So uh, I'm going to say in no particular order, but it is a particular order because it is very carefully chosen by me. Uh, Tabi, you go first, then Isaiah, then Nick. Uh, your three words for 2021. I was hoping you wouldn't ask me first. Um, no, you get words. to go first. <laughs> uh, three words. Um, uh, more of the same. Um, we're in a critical position. Okay, that is not three words. Um, yeah, yeah, but we know what you've got. The same, same is yes, word one. more of the same and also um, leadership required. Okay. Okay. I need one more. I've got same. Okay, same. Leadership. leadership uh, uh, okay, absence of leadership and um, you know, uh, what, um, growth and debt. Ah, okay, so you finish, you take us to the finish point of this afternoon's conversation because I want to go there. Yeah. But um, uh, I'm being unfair to you because, of course, I had the, the privilege of uh, Google, uh, thesaurus, and the afternoon to search for my three words, and I put you on the spot for your three. Asai, you've got a library of books behind you, and we were joking before we came onto this call that that library was so expansive that you actually need a ladder. Uh, I have to say, you are the first person I've seen on a Zoom call to have a ladder in the background. Uh, so congratulations, your three words. <laughs> my, my three word, Prof, the first one is Omicron. Yeah. Second one is electricity. Mm-hmm. The third one is jobs. Cool. Powerful stuff. Nick? Adrian, uh, my three words at very short notice, and it's good to be with everybody. And I'm sure, like me, you can't wait for the year to end so we can take the octopus off our head and see for ourselves <laughs> what's happened. But uh, my three words uh, are shifting sands and resilience. Mm -hmm. I think the ground has moved in subtle ways. I'd like to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And then there's the classic South African sort of knuckle down resilience and fight where you find yourself. Yeah. So Nick, maybe we can use that as a jump off point. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, there's this reference to uh, mask fatigue, COVID exhaustion, uh, the great resignation. Um, uh, you talk about shifting sands and resilience. Uh, we've done two years, two very hard years uh, that were unanticipated. What sense do you make of the landscape? How much is the, what's left in the tank? Where are so, we? So, I mean, I think you, you can look at this at three levels and we all should. One is just the very personal level. Where have you been effective? Where have you struggled? Uh, where have you innovated? And I was reading a, a, an article in the Financial Times just recently that did a global survey. I think it was of 6,000 leaders and 75% of them reported that their lives had changed by more than 50% since the start of COVID, which includes yeah. how they work, their relationships, where they spend their time, uh, what they spend their money on. So, this has been an, you know, it's an extended period of dramatic change. Mm. And I think in a sense, as Alvin Toffler once said, we, we are in future shock. 
I yeah. think the elections, the elections were seismic in subtle ways, which are going to affect the next December elective conference in interesting ways. We can't predict, but we can start painting pictures. And then secondly, to 2024, the space has opened up for contestation. I'd be really interested to hear what others think about this. But I think that something's happened between core voters and conditional voters for all three of the major parties. And they're all trapped. All three are trapped for different reasons, in my view. Mm. And so this is going to open the political dynamics, I think, because people have reached some kind of tolerance tipping point where they're saying enough's enough, either by not voting or by showing support for independence. And I think that's really interesting because why I'm saying this in the discussion about the economy is, as I've always said, politics drives economics in countries like ours and bad politics makes bad economics and good politics makes good economics. And we are in, a, in some kind of that. Let me stop there. Yeah, you, you and I have had that conversation about does P drive E or does E drive P uh, on many occasions. And um, you know, if I rewind to when we first started debating that, probably you know, the, more than 15 years ago, almost 20 years ago, when I first joined you at Gibbs, I was uh, uh, far more convinced that E had the capacity to move P in South Africa. But um, I, I have to concede to you uh, on this debate. P has become a, 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 a powerful um, mover and a mover in unfortunate direction. Uh, I can also uh, uh, contribute to your survey of 6,000 that uh, without question, my life has shifted by more than 50% uh, in the last 24 months, without question. And so the question, if I can just add one thought is, the next level, of course, is companies and their strategy. Mm. And of course, there have been some beneficiaries at the one next. So hold that thought, Nick. I want to come back to that. I, I, yes. I, I'm going to I'm going to come back and press you on that. Lovely. Let me stop there. Asai, uh, in reverse order now, you get to go. Uh, your thoughts on the lay of the land context? What's in the tank? It's really a you know time of great uncertainty. We are not yet out of the woods. The Omicron variant uh, puts a spanner in what would have expected to be an improving environment going into 2022. You can think about monetary policy going forward. Some would have said it's okay for the sub to hike rates and other central banks, but this says perhaps we needed to wait a bit and see how the global economy and the local economy progresses as we go into 2022. On the fiscal side, we also have significant uncertainty. If we do see some lockdowns, depending on whether we are going to see severe illnesses and hospitalizations, we we're chatting a, a little bit earlier before we started. Amongst ourselves, we have more than 15 friends that are already uh, that have already tested positive uh, and of which the news have arrived over the last two days or so so if we see a severe illness and hospitalization that will necessitate some form of lockdowns and lockdowns restric restricting economic activity unemployment rate will continue to go up so in that environment there is going to be a need for further fiscal support beyond march as the MTBPS has put a much you know, end to the current 350 uh, uh, social relief grant. And that then means the fiscal consolidation part that we penciled in in the MTBPS is going to, be, to weaken quite significantly. And with that also coming concerns of credit rating downgrades further down the line. As it stands, the expenditure cuts alone are not going to be enough to bring our debt into, onto a sustainable level. We need growth and we need expenditure cuts. So both are required. And unfortunately growth is, uh, you know, there are some breaks on it from load shedding, which means we will still, uh, you know, have a sub 2% economic growth um, over the, the medium term. And that is insufficient to generate employment that is required 
uh, to reduce the unemployment rates. And then that has implications for how people are going to vote in 2024, given how they voted in the local government elections. Thanks back to you, Prof. Now it's, now it's a meeting because I spoke on mute. Um, so uh, now we are officially uh, in a Zoom call. Um, uh, Modisa Malloy, uh, Nick uh, puts to you the question about corporate strategy. Modisa, we'll come back to that. Uh, and if I can encourage others to put questions into the Q&A. Uh, uh, Tabi, to you, uh, what sense do you make of the landscape and the environment? What's in the tank and what do the headwinds look like? Are there any tailwinds in this environment? Unfortunately, I, I don't see any you know, fuel in the tank as we've seen fuel prices increasing and um, more and more people uh, complaining about that. But it, you know, the tank of the economy, um, what worries me and why I said more of the same is that there is a lack of urgency. And I had hoped that the pandemic would um, make us stop and actually address certain issues, certain structural issues that, that um, uh, impeded on our growth and um, you know, the unemployment um, uh, rates, um, dealing with poverty uh, and inequality, et cetera. And we seem to not have prioritized that even from a you know, policy perspective. Um, we also talk about you know, infrastructure and the need to then grow through infrastructure in order for us to attain uh, long-term sustainable growth. And again, I don't see the, the foundation for that to happen. So that's why I think it's gonna be more of the same. What worries me about growth, and you know, this year we're expecting um, very high growth, um, uh, uh, north of 5%, and that's largely due to base effects, but also largely due to the fact that industries were shut last year. Uh, the only sector that actually was performing, was allowed to perform, was the agriculture sector. And so obviously as uh, industry came back and there was um, recovery there, that also bumped up the number. And that is, you know, uh, if you look beyond uh, 2021, even with when you look at the Saab and Treasury's forecasts, and Treasury typically are, high, uh, are higher than what analysts expect in the next couple of years. But if you take, for instance, the year 2014 and um, uh, 2014 all the way to 2024, uh, and consider National Treasury's forecast, that growth on average for 10 years is less than 1%. And so if you then take 2010 and 2020, you get the same number. So basically we're not growing as an economy, we're just bumping along at the bottom. And that concerns me because uh, their forecasts also consider, um, these are out, you know, output. So basically output is going to be low, employment is going to be uh, um, worse. Uh, that's why the GDP figures are so bad. So, so that, that really does concern me. On, on our fiscal policy, I'm also um, very concerned. You know, there, there has been uh, this debate that Azai and I, uncoordinated, um, have been involved in. And, um, and, it, and it's something that I realized that not many people in the country re realize how, how important it is for their livelihoods as well. And so we are incurring a lot of debt as a country. And the debt is not a problem because I always say there's good debt and bad debt. If you go to the bank to borrow money and you become, you know, you, you, you become a billionaire as a result of the 100,000 um, or the 1 million that you borrowed from a bank, then you pay it over and actually that is a good, um, good debt. But in our case, the debt servicing costs are ridiculously high, are higher than countries that have much higher debt than we do. And so what that is doing is that it is crowding out um, areas where we could actually channel our fiscus towards, which would generate growth. And so, so we're basically, it's almost again, if I use a car as an example, it's like a, a family that, that doesn't have enough money decides to go buy a Ferrari and, um, 
and and cuts on you know everything cuts food cuts education costs cuts all the necessary costs and goes buys a, a ferrari and then spends all the money paying just the interest on the ferrari instead of even just on the ferrari down payments on itself so what we're doing right now is just paying the interest of our debt and just to give you an example so looking at this year financial um financial year 21 22 the debt servicing cost is the third largest line item after health education and so after health education and so it's the fourth after health education and social development but if you look in two years time so 2024 25 it is actually the second biggest line item after education so we're basically paying off debt um instead of actually building hospitals building schools supporting uh, even the poor and the needy so that concerns me. The other third, the last one is I'm worried about the pressures to extend social grants without actually stopping and understanding the ramifications and also holding government to, you know, uh, accountable for even making this decision if it's going to go that route. And now just to clarify, I'm absolutely in support of um, uh, supporting those who are vulnerable and are left jobless because of the pandemic. And this is a short term assistance that I think that the government is obligated to fulfill. Where I am concerned and where discussions are pointing at is this funding of social welfare in perpetuity. Mm. And if you look at the, the um, MTBPS, it actually shows that there's a narrowing of, let's say, um, expenditure. And, and I'm hoping, and I'm hoping that part of that is a narrowing of the social grants, because that is a measure of success, because it will tell me that many people are actually looking for a job or have a job and are self-sustaining. And, and are getting skilled and, and therefore if you have a job, your you know, inflation every year, your salary increases and your, your livelihood in, in improves. But if we are assuming that social grants are going to increase, uh, that to me is worrisome because we are not making an effort to actually chip at the big you know, social grant number. And I mentioned so only it, social grant uh, only because it is a, a significant part of um, the f uh, expenditure together with public sector wage wages. So let me just pause you know, on, that, uh, on that point for a moment um, uh, about the importance of not just uh, initiating growth, but uh, uh, achieving um, uh, inclusive growth. And you might call this, you know, whereas the theme of uh, early 2020 or the policy imperative of early 2020 was lives versus livelihoods. Um, uh, perhaps the theme for 2022 is uh, growth and livelihoods. Um, that uh, growth without jobs is, um, uh, uh, if, if anything, uh, amplifies South Africa's social stresses and strains. And, and to put some numbers to some of the points that you're making. Um, when South Africa uh, was born into democracy, per capita income was $5,800 per person. Uh, if, uh, if policy promises or policy undertakings had translated into reality, that $5,800 today would be $19,000 per person, uh, effectively making South Africa a middle income country. That's the policy ambition. Uh, and uh, I think we do, we can uh, put a sharp uh, point on this, uh, uh, on this, that uh, instead of per capita income going from 5,800 to just over 19,000, it has instead gone from 5,800 to 6,800, with an unemployment rate of 35% and an extended unemployment rate of 45% and a youth unemployment rate uh, approaching 70%. Uh, these numbers take us into the land of crisis. Um, and I'm not sure if uh, uh, how comfortably that term would sit with each of the three of you if I uh, suggest that we finish 2021 in a state of uh, economic uh, uh, crisis, uh, social crisis. It might be too animated uh, to also suggest political crisis. Uh, but there is a, a growing voice about 
uh, uh, concerns around political direction um, of, uh, of the leading party. Uh, your thoughts on my observations. Nick, I'm back with you. Uh, so Adrian, I mean, that's an, I would say we're in a crisis, but we're not about to collapse. Sure. And through, if you look back the last 50 years, we hit these, these peaks of difficulty. And then, you know, it looks like it's calamitous. And then there's a new bottom. And then somehow we bottom out and the bottom becomes the new normal. And then we trundle along and maybe we improve a bit. And then something else hits us. We're very flexible and we're very resilient. So when you quote those numbers of we've lost 2 million jobs since COVID with six dependents, I mean, that's an un unimaginable number. Um, so yeah, there's always a crisis in this country. This is a country of crisis. And the question is, how do we, how do we handle it as best we can? I agree with Tabi's uh, numbers. I, I think you know, we face very tough choices about social support, but I'm a humanitarian. And I, I agree with her choice on policy to say, if we've got to identify those who've lost their jobs and those who really are struggling to feed their children, uh, then we have to limit the social support. And the point she is making, it can't become permanent because if it becomes permanent, we will become a dependency society for the long term. And that would be a terrible tragedy. So people have got to stand up, and, but we've got to give them access to a decent education, to the possibility of work. And, and uh, we've got to get through those difficulties without becoming a state dependency society because it erodes people's basic dignity to have to depend on others. And we can't have that culture. We, we, we aren't those people. And so I'm very apprehensive about this going on for too long. And like uh, Isaiah, I thought, you know, the next year we would see a turnaround and stop because agriculture has had a knockout time, as has mining. And I thought this would then spread more generally and we'd start seeing what he described as fiscal um, consolidation. And maybe yeah, we've just got to wait another over. year. Yeah, maybe we've got to wait another year and get past Omnicron and uh, its nasty message to us. Because I do think there's resilience. And let me just make this point and maybe we'll come back to it. This country needs political activism from the center. And my fear is our elites are able to do what they like without being accountable. And we have to deal with this if we're going to be a healthy democracy. And I think the election results give us a clue that, that, that something's happened structurally. Maybe we'll come back to that. When you say we, we need polit uh, political activism, I think that's, uh, that those are your terms from the center. What, what do you mean by the center? What I mean is that people that are in this audience need to carefully calculate the three risks they face, which is their individual progress in life, the organization or industry they work in, and the country. And the biggest one is a country risk if you're in the middle yeah. class. And so we can't not be politically engaged. All of us carry a responsibility because we educated, we professionals, most of us have jobs, uh, fortunately, and we carry a responsibility to the numbers you were talking about who don't. And they look to us and we need to be looking to the elites and saying, as we are saying in the media and in other places, this is not acceptable. I listened to Lindiwe Zulu's uh, uh, defense of the non-prosecutions on social services. It's outrageous that she can get away politically with saying she doesn't run away from responsibility. We wanted to run to the prosecution and prosecute. And we need the, the correctional services system and the courts to function. People are hurtful, but they're sick and tired of the lack of prosecution. KZN, Zondo, we need to move much faster on these things. And the center is where this voice must come from. I'll say one more thing. I watched Zimbabwe collapse because the middle class sat on its backside. You've just gone on mute, Nick. You went on mute at the critical moment. Unmute I said, yourself. I said, I don't know where I, I, I thought I'd finished, but what I said about Zim is I watched yes. that video unfold and it was the inaction of the middle class that caused the elites to get away with what they did. And if that happened here, it would be a tragedy. I'm not saying South Africa is a Zim. I'm just saying in any society, 
where the elites like Nigeria are able to aggregate, accumulate such extreme wealth while the center doesn't take action is a tragedy for a country, especially one like Got it. Uh, my invitation to uh, participants is um, uh, please give me your three words for 2021. Um, and there is a prize uh, for the best contribution of uh, three words. So please pop those into Q&A. Um, uh, uh, I've got uh, further questions. Uh, just keep uh, dropping those in, please, for me. Uh, Tabi, my, my, my hypothesis is that South Africa is in a cocktail of economic, uh, social, and political crisis. Um, definitely. I, and, and the crisis, unfortunately, requires strong leadership. I often have debates with my younger brother about this, and I say, you know, we need a, um, a belligerent, uh, not, I don't want to say a dictator, but um, a leader, because he then says, no, but then my rights, I want to be, you know, I want the freedoms of democracy and stuff. And then he made me also question whether is democracy suitable for a country like ours? And um, then I had a, uh, I've been lecturing at, at uh, Harvard for the, um, uh, for um, Danny Roderick's class for the past, I think, two weeks. Um, and the lecturer before me came from Argentina and he asked the same question about Argentina. And he said, is democracy suitable for an equal societies? Because decisions have to be made. And it's very difficult to make such decisions in a democracy where we're so polarized. And I actually think that we are increasingly polarized than ever before, um, which makes it very difficult to make to have quick uh, make quick decisions. Um, so if you look at, for instance, if I if I was um, I had made you know if I was given the choice to make decisions, something like jobs, I would make sure that everyone. Who, is, who can work, especially the youth, is employed, degree or not. Get them employed, train them on the job. I would get rid of, uh, of minimum wage. Minimum wage, you introduce it when you have uh, at least a significant portion of your population employed. Yesterday's numbers or two days ago, mm. uh, they indicated that if we include um, discouraged workers, so the the broader definition of unemployment, 46.6% of South Africans yeah. are unemployed. So That's one in two. It's a terrifying exactly. number. So if you then look at the rate of growth, in the second quarter of next year, 50% of South African citizens will be mm -hmm. unemployed. How do you grow an economy? How do you solve problems? How do you, you cannot do that. How do you ensure social cohesion when 50% of your population, your working population from the age of 15 to 65 is unemployed? So again, I'd, I'd really get rid of minimum wage, employ every, as many people as possible. And um, in, in just in the way that I always talk about Switzerland, the only problem, yes, is that we don't have a Swiss basic education, but that can catch up. We need to change our basic education, but we need to get South Africans employed and skilled. Um, I would also make sure that, you know, you know. Could I just press pause on that point and ask you, you know, is it realistic, as, as, as critical as you might suggest that labor market reform is of uh, remove a minimum wage, is it realistic when you've got one of the key political members of the political coalition is, is a labor movement? But that's why I said, you know, the, the problem with democracy is that you have ideologues who, who, right. who, who stand in the way of progress. Uh, we have a crisis here. And really the crisis of employment to make sure that there's food in the stomachs of South Africans. The only way to ensure that is to employ people. The only way to do so is ensure that the environment is conducive for companies to operate in uh, and, and employ. So things like, you know, we have regulations that are very restrictive in the country currently. Uh, you know, we, we don't support entrepreneurship as much as we, we should. We talk about it, but we don't support it. Uh, if, we, if we decided right now to change the mandate of the land bank, the IDC, the DBSA, all those DFIs to say a portion of your money should go take a risk on South Africans, uh, you know, mm -hmm. fund um, uh, those who want to start businesses. 
that's how you should do it. That's how Asia did it when they developed, when their banks actually uh, supported um, entrepreneurs. That's what we should do. But in deciding this, the debate then gets, uh, you know, sidetracked because of ideology and, you know, why you're yeah. removing the minimum wage. And my argument is not that I want to make everyone, you know, get pittance. I want everyone to work. I want everyone to be skilled. And, and that's the only way. And I want people to, to get out of poverty as quickly as possible. Um, Professor Benadel <laughs> talked about Nigeria. Just yeah. my last point on Nigeria. So in Nigeria, a lot of my Nigerian friends will tell you that, look, you run your own government. You, you, you have your um, water supply, you have your electricity, your generator, so you have your security. So you're the minister of everything in your household. So whatever happens outside of your household is irrelevant. What's happening in South Africa? Everyone is getting solar panels. Everyone is getting water, uh, borehole water. Everyone is getting um, security of their own. And never mind that hospital care and you know everything else, schooling is all privatized. We are headed that way. Um, and so very soon you are going to be your minister of everything. And what happens outside is irrelevant because you have water, you have electricity, uh, you watch Apple TV if SABC then goes under. And, and, and that can't be fair because there's a whole, you know, plus 50% of the population that is living in poverty. Mm -hmm. You, uh, again, you remind me of some uh, very valuable stats, Dambisa Moyo. Uh, shows the uh, endurance or persistence of uh, democracy under certain uh, preconditions of per capita income. Uh, and South Africa is, finds itself located in a vulnerable per capita income patch, that democracy is vulnerable in South Africa's per capita income uh, circumstance. Nick, perhaps we can come back to this. Um, uh, three words. Nick Campbell says, time to unite. Uh, Rihanna Rousseau says, reset, reassess, retry. Uh, Grant has a couple of goes. Government animated stupor. Uh, that's certainly a prize for uh, good candor. Uh, Grant Elephant says, head in sand uh, is <laughs> a second set of three words. Uh, Herman, uh, challenging uncertainty is extreme difficulty. Uh, Jeff Addison, tension, resilience, regression. Um, and Jeff Addison, again, his three words are disbelief. Ah. <laughs> uh, let's have more. This is uh, a, a great way to get your voices into the room. I, I promise to come back to the earlier questions. I will. But Isaiah, your view on my uh, thesis, and I'm going to press you just on time uh, so that we can get to talk about the corporate strategy, uh, how we lead through this uh, period of incredible stress uh, how we find resilience. Isaiah, your thoughts on the thesis of crisis? Thanks, Prof. I think a lot has been said quite, uh, already. So I'll put this analogy. If the South African economy was a patient, it is out of ICU, very critical, but stable, and yet not ready to be discharged. And the doctors that are the political elites and policymakers have run out of ideas such that they continue to prescribe the, the, the only medication they have prescribed over the last two decades, hoping something will come along and help the patient to recover completely. That's and the patient is no longer 35, the patient is now 53. Perhaps, absolutely. So that's, that's how I would, I, would, I would, you know, try to explain where we are. We are continuing to provide the same type of policy uh, advice that have not yet yielded results, in part because we have not implemented, uh, in part because it is not suited for a country with such a high unemployment rate. And this is one thing that is baffling about the South African economy and labor market in particular. We don't have the skills. We have a large population that is unemployed. It's one of the most surprising things, which for me is something that could be solved, and it has been done in other countries. The Chinese success as far as lifting millions of people out of poverty, yes, they have human rights issues, 
But outside of that, they have been able to lift millions of people out of poverty by learning very specific things from other countries and implement it in their own country that lifts a lot of people out of poverty. Singapore, from a small island that was colonized by the British with no mineral resource, grew up to be one of the most successful economies in the world. Yes, it's small, but it grew to become successful. Rwanda, close to us, is showing significant improvement on the UN you know, development goals. All these are underlined by decisive leadership that have a vision for what society needs to be like, which is something that we lack as a country. We disagree on almost everything, and there is almost no one that holds the center together to say, as a nation, this is where we need to go. That's why we disagree on how we should do climate change currently after COP26. We are all over the place. We don't have a national policy that is well understood by everybody. That's why we disagree on whether debt or growth, uh, you know, but maliciously, something debt is good, even if it goes to current spending. But we still disagree on that. That's why we haven't made a decision as far as improving our education outcomes. 20 years later, we still churn out graduates which end up being unemployed because they're not required by the private sector. That's why we still disagree on how to solve our energy crisis. 10 years later, since the first load sharing in 2008, we still haven't managed to solve energy. How difficult can it be when the Chinese can build a whole new hospitals in a week? What, why are we failing to solve our energy issues in more than a decade? For me, those are some of the things that I can see that it's a, a lack of leadership and decisiveness. And in leadership, you are not going to satisfy everybody. But as long as the majority you know, is lifted out of poverty and you find ways to compensate the losers out of the policy, for me, that would be a great thing. But so far, it's a house too late. So we've got uh, uh, two, uh, two economists. Um, uh, uh, maybe I should put myself into the hat also and say three economists um, <laughs> alongside our um, uh, our, our professor in strategy, uh, and we are doing a good job uh, of what economists are expert at, and that's depressing everyone, um, uh, pointing out all the problems uh, and uh, and the challenges. You know, Isaiah, uh, you you make two points which uh, which I'd like to put some of my own data around, and you reference Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda in 2012 was ranked 130th in the world in ease of doing business, notwithstanding the challenges of ease of business measure, that, that there are complaints about that metric itself, but we get the general direction of travel. 2012, Rwanda ranked 130th in the world. Most recent measure, Rwanda had improved to 35th or so uh, in the world. Over the same period, 2012 to 2019, South Africa went from uh, 30th in the world, ease of business, to 85th, um, ease of business not quite swapping places with Rwanda, but uh, showing that we perhaps were becoming our own worst enemy. Um, and I think you're referencing that. The other point that you make is that South Africa has this incredible potential photovoltaic irradiation uh, to generate renewable energy. And the small economy of Costa Rica in the 1990s built a renewable, uh, they overhauled their entire electricity supply system in three years and last year did 300 days without interruption on renewables. Um, you know, South Africa has an incredible potential and a, and a fantastic renewable energy investment framework, yet 98%, and that isn't a made up number, 98% of our energy is coal fired. Um, so there's this huge dislocation between uh, prospect potential and the reality. And, you know, Nick, in the world of strategy, we're told that strategy is an act of war. It's not what you write, it's what you do. So in positions of leadership, you know, what do we do uh, if we are leading uh, businesses, governments, uh, organizations, for-profit, not-for-profit? What do we do in this environment, Nick, 
to lead? So uh, let me, uh, thanks for that question. It's a good one. So firstly, I mean, we're about to have this strange season, which is to stop the clock, stop the engines and take a deep breath and look in the mirror and try and read the map. And that's my first advice is to everybody is to make sure that you really take time to think deeply about what has happened this year at a strategic level, not the day to day, not the latest thing in, in the newspaper, but to think back and say, what's happened in the last year or maybe two, and how's it affected you or your business or your industry or our country and capture that and take the time to stop and really reflect because South Africans are very emotional. We go at the surface level and I'm much more interested in the systems and the structures that underlie the surface. And which is why I would disagree with Toby and I'm get, I'll come to that if you uh, allow me to. So first point is this, it's no good having a sense of direction unless you can execute. And it's no good having a good, being good at execution unless you've got a sense of direction. So the second thing to do individually and in companies is to prepare, prepare alternatives, to ask yourself some simple what if questions and forget about budgeting and planning. I mean, you've still got to do that to keep the board happy, but, but think about strategy differently and think about what options have you got under what conditions, what ifs, what if this happens, what if that happens? South Africa is very diverse in its industries and its companies and its geographies. It's not a one size fits all. This is not Switzerland where everything is very similar. This can, you know, if you take KZN or the Eastern Cape where I am today or Gauteng, these are different economies and they have different drivers. So make sure you understand where you are. You may be in a growth industry right now. Uh, many ICT companies are telling me they're having fantastic growth. So know where you are and then develop options rather than just have one plan and try and be more flexible. And the last piece of advice I would say is read outside your subject area. Whether it's who you talk to or what you think about or what you read or how you stimulate your mind for the next year and come back in January with a plan and be ready to change it, but have a plan. And that's what strategy is. Strategy is about having a point of view about next and being willing to shift it if you need to. And the last thing I want to say about this is, you know, strategy wins in the end because it's about imposing your will on the world. It's about making choices. And so we can see a Tesla or a discovery that has made choices. And if they're lucky, they've been good choices. And if it's Nuspass, it's made very bad choices except for 10 cent. So, you know, it doesn't always, it doesn't mean you'll succeed, but impose your will on the world because the environment is pretty flexible. It's pretty fungible. And so let me say that. But I want to come back, if I can, just for 60 seconds to Tabi's uh, point, because I would actually agree with her about the minimum wage and where she's going to on the benevolent, she ended up withdrawing the dictator and talking about leader. Is that <laughs> Of course, you can't do that at the moment. And it's because I think we have leaders with old mindsets. They've drunk the Kool-Aid of the 60s and the 70s, and they're in very powerful positions. Uh, I can think of several ministers to whom I would apply this. And they're not really open to strategy, to thinking about energy or education in a different way, the digital economy in a different way. And so I, I, the question I would pose for us all to really think deeply about is this. Are you philosophically a Democrat? Philosophically. Is it a, a non-negotiable for you as it is for me? It may not be. And I'm coming across many South Africans who say, you know, as I use the Rwanda, Singapore, China argument, those are not democracies. We are. Mm -hmm. So are we saying that the system of democracy is above our pay grade and we've got to settle for something else and all I would say is I'd ring a very big alarm bell about short term versus the long term. Because what are you going to do with the son of the dictator? Because that's mm. what inevitably happens if you give so mm. much power to the center. So I'm a big banker on making the system work and holding leaders accountable in the media, in public opinion, in forums like these, 
in voter choices, in supporting different groups to say, no, the system's right, but we're not managing the system. And we in business are often at fault because we just want to get on with our jobs or get on with our business. Yeah. This is a mistake because for Standard Bank, the real risk is not running Standard Bank or beating ABSA. The real risk is country risk. And that's yeah. true for many of our big companies. That the country goes over the road runner yes. cliff. And uh, Nick, uh, your, your discussion there uh, is actually captured by Mark Lamberti in his three words, where he says 2021, his three words for 2021, death of accountability. Um, and that's what you're imploring here. Uh, so Mark, uh, I, I think that that circles straight back uh, to you. Um, uh, uh, Johannes uh, Hope says, holes in, the t holes in tank. Um, and uh, see crop uh, growth jobs travel uh, or lack thereof. Um, uh, so, uh, if, if, uh, Asai, if we come to you, Nick, let me just uh, pre warn you, we've got uh, eight minutes to our close. So, I'm going to come back to you for your three words for 2022. Um, uh, so, you've got time to formulate your three words. Uh, Asai, uh, Nick says, uh, you know, What's the risk that democracy is above our pay grade uh, and that uh, perhaps uh, we shouldn't wish uh, for this dictatorship, uh, uh, a single party state, benevolent or otherwise, um, uh, and that uh, the, the inheritor of that uh, single party state dictatorship is, uh, is a son, uh, never a daughter. Um, but uh, Isaiah, your response to that? to that risk? Do you see that as a risk? Potentially, there is a risk, but from where I'm standing, I, I, would, I would choose to take a former US president's quote, whether a cat is black or white, doesn't matter as long as it can catch mice. Mm -hmm. And what mice do we have is the big, uh, you know, three problems of unemployment, inequality, and poverty. Whether it's a democratic state, or more of a benevolent dictator, uh, I would take that any day as long as we are going to have 5% unemployment rate. Uh, if we can guarantee that, I'll be happy with, to live with it because what use is democracy with 75% of the youth unemployed? What, yeah. youth, what use is democracy with our public health care system not working? What use is democracy with an insurgence or riots that we saw in July? That for me is evidence, at least in our case, that democracy has not delivered what it's supposed to. It's failing the country. It has delivered in other countries, but in our case, it has not delivered. Maybe it needs to be modified because we cannot continue to advocate for the same structure of the economy which reproduces the problems which we tried to undo for so long. It just doesn't make sense. Um, uh, Tabi, if I come to you, um, actually, well, before I come to you, Jeff Allison uh, clarifies his observation. Uh, his three words, disbelief, uh, he, he, he animates to say uh, disbelief there. Uh, this is not, B is acting and Leaf, uh, Leaf there is not acting with love. Um, uh, I think that these are very keen insights. Leadership in this country, Jeff says, is not acting in the best interest of the majority of this nation. Uh, how do you get embroiled in a pandemic corruption scandal where the biggest crisis will face um, uh, whilst the country is wrestling with uh, a healthcare delivery? Um, uh, Tabi, I had the uh, good fortune of being able to ask uh, each of our panelists um, for some questions to put to each other. So it, it gives me the impression of having some very clever questions. Uh, these are your fellow panelists putting questions to you. And the question to you from your fellows, Tabi, is uh, are reforms being implemented with sufficient speed or can we anticipate an improvement uh, in speed in the pace of reform in South Africa for 2022? Is that on the cards? Okay, so, so I wish I had addressed the, the previous, what um, Professor and Isaiah mentioned. 
um, before. I don't know if I have a few no, seconds. No, you don't get a chance to do that. <laughs> okay, I fully agree with that. What Isaiah has said. I'm, 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 I'm in my my debates. I've got my four brother. minutes. I've got to work with what I've got. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, so in terms of reforms, um, I don't see uh, reforms being implemented. We've been talking about various reforms for a while. Um, the largest one being the, the NDP, which hasn't been adopted. And I think the most applicable one and easy to adopt is the Treasury one where they focused on network industries. We're still diddy dealing about Spectrum. Um, the, and one of the uh, network industries, uh, electricity, the energy sector. And I don't think that we're, uh, you know, where there's expediency there. Um, the fact that we actually don't know what is happening right now with Medupi, Kusile, and Ingula as a country is shocking. Like, we don't know why um, these power stations have not been completed. Uh, the other thing is that the fact that there is no transparency um, uh, with Medupi and uh, Kusile in terms of who is supplying coal and who are the contractors is also shocking. Um, and also the fact that even to the lenders, the uh, ESCOM is not willing to reveal who these um, the suppliers are. Um, so and that's, you know, that's one of the network industries. That's one of the reforms that National Treasury has identified. Um, so, you know, education is something that we don't even talk about. And our education is not fit for purpose. Our graduates, I think about 11% of our graduates are unemployed. That's another thing that we're not talking about um, and not treating with expediency. Um, so just, you know, all in all, to give you a short answer, I don't think reform, we, we will not see reforms. And going back to what Isaiah was saying, you need leadership and you need stern leadership. At this moment, this democracy is not working because it allows for a lot of room to dilly-dally and not to be held accountable. Um. Nick, before we close out, uh, there's a specific question to you, a direct question to you, which says uh, uh, not just uh, the need to adapt, what should companies do to adapt? So it's the act of learning and unlearning that how you've got in the room is not how you're going to get out of the room. And making sure that you've got an open enough culture to explore some radical ideas that really take into account how the demand is shifting. Both the volume and the needs are shifting very rapidly, whether you're a real estate agent or a hotel or a shoemaker. These patterns of demand is where you have to live. So you've got to be in the markets. You've really got to understand how products and service are used or not used, what the price points are, and you've got to live outside in order to lead inside. And, and very often we get caught with spreadsheets and budgets and board meetings instead of asking what's the joy of use or what's the discomfort that people, the market we're targeting is experiencing. And that's how you have, you have to put time aside to think. You just can't go and do an eight hour job in the same way. You've got to get outside this organization and start looking for new ideas and make sure you've got a culture and systems to do that. As someone once said to me, if you're a hammer, everything will look like a nail. And that's how we tend to lead too often. So we I just want to say one last thing. I think this debate, this debate about democracy is one we really need to have. I, yeah. I, I'm so taken by what both the other panelists have said. And I have to say to you that the, the classes I taught in the last three months at Gibbs reflect similar sentiments and it scares the living hell out of me. And I think it'll be a wonderful debate uh, to have. I'm finding increasingly that people are prepared to make this trade-off. And that tells us we failed the grade of real leadership. So where we absolutely agree is we need mm. a new generation of leadership. Um, we, we, we're at the top of the hour, guys. So we need to um, uh, pull our, our conversation to a close. Um, and I want to I want to thank uh, uh, each of you for your for your valuable uh, insights and contributions in uh, in very very tough circumstances. While I uh, close up the conversation, I'm going to invite each of you to give us your three words uh, for 2022. I'll come to you in a moment. 
uh, I promised a prize for the three words from our uh, participants. And uh, the panel of one has chosen Jeff Addison's contribution um, uh, as, the, uh, uh, as the recipient. Uh, Jeff Addison, your three words for 2021, uh, disbelief uh, or the animated version disbeliefter, uh, because uh, you also did a little short essay to explain exactly uh, how this should all be uh, interpreted and digested. And so if the dad humor travels, Jeff, here is your award uh, that I promised. I promised the prize and it is the prize, uh, which is uh, you're, you're the recipient um, uh, of this fantastic trophy, uh, the three word award for December, 2021 uh, of the Gibbs Economic Outlook Flash Forum. <laughs> uh, you can put it onto LinkedIn, I'll endorse it. Um, uh, uh, so everyone, thank you for, for your contributions. Let's close out with uh, three words uh, uh, from Isaiah, your three. Prof, I would say uh, still electricity, jobs, and this time leadership. Cool, true to form. Nick, your three. My three are furious, get really angry guys, it's time for a fight. Get faster and make sure we're fair. Fast, furious, fair, neat. Tavi? Okay, mine is uncertainty, debt, and I'll say um, unemployment. Thank you. Uh, we end the year uh, not on a cheerful note, on a tough note. We find ourselves in uh, incredibly trying times uh, with rapidly moving uh, landscape and the insights and contributions that the three of you have brought uh, to the conversation really help you know, the leaders, the executives, uh, the decision makers who uh, are participants uh, in this flash forum this afternoon. I'm going to uh, borrow from your observations uh, uh, in, um, uh, in closing out to say that the three words that I would volunteer uh, for 2022, having listened to this conversation uh, uh, are from Tavi, dilly-dallying about spectrum. Dilly-dallying counts as one word. Um, uh, uh, from Isaiah, I'm going to uh, mix yours uh, and say renewable, um, renewed uh, and uh, uh, inclusion. And from Nick, I'm going to say, read the map. So th uh, to our, uh, our guests on the forum, uh, thank you for being with us. To our panelists, thank you for uh, being with us for, for the hour. It's great to see you guys. Travel safe if you're moving around in December. Be safe wherever you are um, and uh, finish the year. Uh, with time to reflect, digest, renew, and we will see you uh, in a better 2022. Thank you, everyone.